G'day, my name's Duncan Corby. I'm the Academic Dean here at Hillsong College and also one of the senior lecturers in our vocational and degree programs. What I'd like to do in this session is to give you a taster of the kind of things that you can experience in the classroom. One of the subjects I teach is New Testament intro. It forms one of the subjects across all of the Bible subjects we do across the three years of our vocational leadership and ministry programs. And in our New Testament intro subject, which is one of our first year subjects, one of our goals is, as the name suggests, introduce you to the New Testament, but more importantly, change and enlarge the way that you read your Bibles. So here is a quick overview of a key idea I try to get across to our students. Let's see how you go with this one. Let's think about our Bibles for a moment and the way that most people typically read their Bibles. Obviously, we are familiar with the idea that our Bibles are authored by God. And we read the Bibles, this is me down here, so that I can hear from God. So when I read my Bible, I'm there doing my daily devotions, I got my Bible open and I pray, Lord, speak to me today. And what we're hoping for is that as I'm reading the Bible, God will speak to me. What we typically mean by that is in some way, shape or form, it's going to be like the words will leap off the page at me, that there is a certain phrase or a certain sentence or a certain idea that becomes particularly meaningful and poignant to me in that moment. And in that kind of experience, I have this sense that God is speaking to me. And that's the way that most of, our re most of us read our Bibles all the time. The really good thing about reading our Bibles that way is that when God speaks to us that way, it is often a life-transforming experience. It builds faith, it changes character, it produces difference in our lives. But I think the thing that we want to recognise is that that doesn't happen as often as we might like. Despite the fact that we have powerful encounters with God in the Scriptures, there are some days when we do our devotions, the Bible's just a book. So is there a way that we can enlarge the way that we read our Bible so that we can continue to get more out of it, not just in each of our devotional times, but over the rest of our lives? Because if you stop and think about it, the Bible is the only book that you and I as Christians are going to read all our lives. Every other book we will read and once we're done with it, we may never pick it up again. There might be certain favourites that we'll read two or three times. But the Bible is a book that we aspire to read every day for the rest of our lives. How are we going to keep that up? How are we going to keep getting new gold, new life-transforming encounters out of our reading of the Bible? Well, this is what we try to do in New Testament intro and in many of our Bible subjects at college. What we do is we want to take seriously how it is we got the Bible in the first place. So let's think about how you and I end up with the Bible in our hands. God did not write the Bible to you and me, as in it didn't, wasn't just written a few years ago. It's been around for several thousands of years. Well, how did it come into being? It came into being this way. God, at some point in the past, spoke through an author to an audience. And this all happened somewhere in history. And that communication event happened within a context, a context where the audience is facing certain challenges, where the author is trying to help them in real and useful ways. And in the midst of that, God is speaking through that author to make a supernatural difference in the life of that audience as they're grappling with being the people of God at that point in their history. And that's where each of the books of the Bible came from. God speaking through an author to an audience in a context at some point in the historical past. That's where the Bible comes from. The thing is that you and I are, lead, are reading the Bible today, in many cases, at least 2,000, if not three or 4,000 years after the book was first written. And what I try to encourage our students to do 
is to read the Bible in such a way that they're not just going from God to me. Instead, they are going, what was it that God was trying to say into this context to those people? And once I understand that, then ask, and what might that mean for me? And that means that we're going to immerse ourselves in the Bible in a much richer and deeper way. We're going to be asking not only, God, what are you trying to say to me? But you're trying to understand, God, what is it you were trying to say to them? What was going on in their lives and in their world, in their context? What were their problems? What were their issues? What were their aspirations? What were the unique challenges that they were facing as the people of God in their period of history? And Lord, how did you speak meaningfully and helpfully to them in a way that made a real difference? And once I've understood that, then I'm in a position to ask, now that I've understood it, what message can I get for me in my modern life? Because I too am a person living at a point in history living in a context, facing challenges with problems, issues, aspirations, trying to be a faithful follower of God in my point in history. That's why the Bible continues to have something to say to us. So let's have a think about how that might work in practice. There are some verses that you and I read which that's really easy. Let's take John 3.16, everyone's favourite verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, great verse. That's one of those verses where it's easy to go, God, what are you trying to say to me about that? And there could be any number of things that God might want to say to you about, out of John 3.16. It could be about his love, about his son, about believing, about everlasting, like any number of things that God could be wanting to say to you. But if we then think, well, God first said that to a bunch of people in the first century, what was God trying to say to them? And the likelihood is what he was saying to them is pretty much the same as what he's going to be saying to you and I. So that's an easy example. Another example in that kind of category is going to be Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Again, what it meant to the ancient Israelite audience a uh, long time before Jesus, is probably very similar to what it means for you and I. Although you and I might be, in a, you know, we're living in the modern world where very few of us are shepherds and they're reading it in the ancient world where a great number of them are shepherds. But apart from those kind of differences, we all pretty well get what it means. Let me now ask a harder question. If you read 1 Corinthians you'll discover that Paul has got a lot to say in a couple of chapters about food sacrificed to idols. Well, what on earth do we do with that? Because I don't know about you, but I'm not challenged with the temptation to sacrifice food to idols. For most of us, especially living in developed countries, offering food to idols is just not something we do. It's not part of our world. It's not part of our context. So does that mean that that passage about food sacrificed to idols has got nothing to say to us? Well, if we're only thinking about a God, what are you trying to say to me? Well, then it probably isn't going to say much to us. But it's in the Bible, which means it's there for a reason, which means it has ongoing things to say to God's people throughout history, even when people stop sacrificing food to idols. So what we need to do is follow this path. We need to ask, why were people sacrificing food to idols? Why might Christians be tempted to do so in the first century? Why was the author, in this case Paul, thinking that that's a problem? What's he trying to achieve in their lives? And once, he's un once we've understood what's going on there, we can then ask the tricky question of, are there any similar kind of circumstances for us today which aren't food sacrifice to idols but where the same principles apply? We're only able to ask that question if we first asked, what is it that God was trying to say to them? Let me give you an example from in between. We all know Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, to prosper you and give you a future. We all know that verse, right? And we all know that verse typically in the context of God speaking to you and me. And I read that and go, oh, God's got a plan for my life. God wants to prosper me. God wants to bless me. He doesn't want to harm me. I, I'm pumped with that and it builds faith and it changes and transforms my life as I engage with it in this kind of way. But once we understand this, we realise 
God didn't say that first to you and me, but he said that to a bunch of Jewish people who were living in exile in Babylon after the nation of Israel had been destroyed and the population had been taken off into captivity and they were wondering whether they did have a future anymore as the people of God or had God completely abandoned them. It's in that context that God says, I have a plan and a purpose for you to bless you and not to harm you. And once we get a feel for what that must have meant to those Jewish exiles living in Babylon several centuries before Jesus, that fills out the context. It makes the picture come alive for us. And we discover that the Bible is written to real people living real lives in a real world facing real challenges and trying to make the best they can of trying to be God's faithful people in a challenging situation. And once we get that, we realise, ah, the Bible's got something to say to me. Just as he said to these people that God's got a plan for them to bless them and to give them a future, he's also got that for me. In fact, that's what God has always been like for his people. And that now becomes a richer and thicker and I think more life-changing way of approaching the Bible. So when you do your one, two or three years here at Hillsong College, that is a bit of an example of the way of thinking that we're going to take you through as you learn to read your Bible in deeper, richer, larger and hopefully life-transforming ways. If you'd like to learn some more about this, there's an article that I've written that you can download on our Facebook page. And stay tuned for more great sessions.